flagship station, Sports Radio 610, and three on the Titans flagship, move 104.5 zone. He makes uh, two weekly appearances on Fox Sports Southwest. He's been a regular contributor to the Sports Exchange, Sporting News, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, the NFL Network, Comcast, Fox Sports 1, and Sirius Radio. Has a multitude of awards that I've also listed at the bottom of his bio. I'm very pleased to introduce you to John McLean from East Brown. I apologize for him reading it all by him. I didn't know he was going to read all of it. Um, thank you for having me. And uh, I want to tell you right quick how I went from being where you are to where I am now. This is my 41st year at Chronicle, my 38th year of covering the NFL. To me, there's nothing like the NFL. As much as I love basketball and college football, and as not the Astros now, but the Astros sometimes. <coughs> Excuse me. The NFL drives the bus. There's nothing like the National Football League. I covered the Oilers for 20 years. I moved to Nashville. I started doing radio up there, the first training here. And now I'm in my 20th year of doing radio up there, and they can't figure out. New people come to that organization, they never can understand why a guy from Houston, the enemy, covers the Texans is on their flagship station three times a week. And um, one of the things I've learned is 
so much of what we do in life is luck. And the way I got in this business was luck. When I was your age, I had no clue what I wanted to do. In high school, when I was in high school, the Vietnam War was going on. I had friends get drafted or enlisted or were killed. And my goal was just to do whatever it took to stay out of Vietnam. So you had to go to college. You went to college, you weren't going to get drafted. So we were really poor at Waco. There's a junior college called McLennan. And I went, and I just wanted to take the easiest classes I could. And I don't know fate. I don't believe in fate. I think you make, you know, what happens to you in your life, you, you're in control of it. But the way we were seated in a class, an introduction of mass communications, somebody told me it was easy. And I said, okay, that's my kind of, that's my kind of class. And I sat in this, in this class next to a guy, and we started talking about sports. His name was Kurt Wallace, because he changed my life. And just because we sat next to each other. And one day after, during the first week of being there in September of 1971, he said, we have an opening at the Tribune Herald for Friday Night Football. Would you be interested? I said, you work at the Waco paper? He said, yeah. I said, what are you doing at a junior college? He said, well, I'm a photographer and I'm trying to get my degree. Got to have at least one degree to work. So I said, what's Friday Night Football? He said, well, we hire people to come in and the correspondents call on the telephone and you fill out a form with the stats from the game. And then you give it to the writers to write. I said, how long do I need to be there? He said, 8 midnight. I said, what's he pay? $25. I said, can I bring my girlfriend? He said, she only paid my football. I said, she wouldn't be my girlfriend if she didn't. So my girlfriend, who became my first wife, we did that. And and I noticed the writers would go cover games and they would come in and go into the sports office. So at midnight, everybody that was brought in like us as a correspondent left. And I told her, I said, let's stick around. I'd like to get to know these guys a little bit because they need to write about sports. And so I did get to know them. And I found out you get ball games free. And I was a Cowboys fan then. I'm kind of ashamed to admit it. That's okay. I tell all the people with the Texans, I said, how come there's so many Cowboy fans down here? I said, they're like humidity, mosquitoes, and traffic. You just learn to live with them. And they do. And I was a big Cowboy fan. I said, you guys can get the Cowboy games free? And they said, yeah. And I said, you get Baylor games free? I said, what if you want to go to the Astrodome and see the Astros? Yeah. I said, wow. And I told my girlfriend, I said, I didn't want to be a sports writer. So at that point, I decided to take it seriously. We didn't have computers, we had typewriters. And I didn't, I didn't know anything about English. So I came back and I went to the head of the journalism at this community college. And I said, if I want to be a sports writer, what do I need to do? And she told me. And my goal was to transfer to Baylor. And then I did the smartest thing I've ever done in my life. I took all the hard classes at Baylor at this junior college, including all my religion requirements, and everything transferred. And I was fortunate enough, my sophomore year, my junior year at Baylor, I got hired full time at Waco Baylor. So I spent my last three years at Baylor working 60 hours a week, getting off at 2 a.m., going home, studying for about an hour while I was half asleep. But I managed to graduate and already had the job I wanted. All because I took that class, MassCom, sitting next to Kurt Wallace, that gave me that opportunity. So my message to you is always take advantage of every possible person you can meet that can help you. Uh, Mr. Monty back there used to work with the Chronicle. He knows people. The Chronicle, Vanessa Morris. Uh, I'm sorry. Coach, 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 like coach. Sorry. Uh, Vanessa knows a lot of people in the media business here. She used to be in the media business. If you are majoring in journalism, you think, or communications, you have an interest, and it's a great business. I've been to 38 Super Bowls. I've been to 15 Pro Bowls in Hawaii. I've been to Tokyo and the Chronicles in Spain, and North Mexico City for the Texans and Raiders this season, the regular season. And I've been blessed to have the job that I have. And in talking on talk shows to me, 
I feel like to get paid to talk about sports, I should be arrested every time I walk out of a talk show or get off the phone because I know so many people that would like to trade with me. And people say, well, what does it take? And I say, well, you got to have a knowledge of sports to be able to be on a sports talk show. And then I hear people on sports talk shows and they ask, not exactly right. It helps, but mainly pay attention to the people around you. If they bring in a speaker, try to ask that speaker questions. Follow up, get an email. Don't be afraid to ask people for help. Most people want to help people who want to be helped. Not everybody, but most. By the way, if you guys got a question, just hold up your hand. I can come on for three or four hours here about sports and communications and journalism. What I do really is not a job. I tell people at the Chronicle, I tell people on radio stations, never complain. We don't, we don't have a real job. We write to talk about sports. We're blessed. It's a privilege. There's other people in the real world. They have real jobs. We don't. I had writers and talk to host of four hours a day, 20 hours a week, complaining about how hard he's working. It's a period break. All you do is flap your yap on the radio. That's not hard work. And the way I got my foot in the door doing this was in 1976, first time I was in Houston covering a hockey team here, original Houston Arrows. And I was in Canada, and the guy who was the play by play guy asked me if I wanted to be on the radio in between periods. And I said, I've never been on the radio. He said, It's okay, I'll just ask you some questions. I said, Don't ask me about hockey. He said, why? I said, well, I don't know anything about hockey. He said, how did you get this job? I said, it's a long story. I just don't ask me about hockey. So he put me on there and we faked it pretty well. And he turned out to be the host of the first talk show in Houston and he started putting me on the air. And I've been doing that now since 76, full time since 1985. And always today, because you have the internet, you have so many advantages. Whatever you want to write about or talk about, it could be fashion, it could be sports, it could be anything. Know about it. Be knowledgeable about what you're what you're writing or talking about. If you're going to interview somebody, know that person you're interviewing. All you have to do is get on the internet and you can find everything at your fingertips. If you know about the history of what your your interests are, that makes you even more knowledgeable. I've always thought to appreciate the present, you got to understand the past. I still look up things about history. I'm fascinated all the time. And ask questions. Never be afraid to ask a question. You may think it's a dumb question. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Ask questions. Always have some questions to ask, too. And follow up. If you need somebody to elaborate, ask them that. Don't be afraid in our business to make mistakes. I make mistakes like crazy because of the Internet. They just want it out there. Great stories on Twitter, never in the Chronicle anymore. Time the story comes out in the Chronicle, it's so, so old, it's got Boston. Right now, it's all about you break it on Twitter, then you rewrite on Twitter, then when you're through tweeting, then you write blogs and you update blogs, and then you say, oh, okay, what's left for the paper? You try to come up with a different angle. It's a great time to be in the communications business. You can work for teams, you can work for organizations, you can work. PR, marketing, special events. You can cover things for newspapers, websites, TV stations, radio stations. And if you're interested in this, you don't have to make a career decision while you're in high school, but if you are interested in it, do as much as you can. Find out if you find out if you think this could be something you want to pursue in college. University of Houston has a great communication program. Texas. I'm not the mayor, so I hate the problem. But I have to admit, Texas's communication department is much better than its football team because it's ranked in the top five every year. But U of H, U of H has come on. We have a lot of editors from the Chronicle who are teaching at U of H. Yeah, I gotta tell you, if you want to work for the Chronicle, go take their class, butter them up, take them out. Because they can help you get a job. You need to know things like that. There's other good programs in the state, Sam Houston State, where Vanessa went to school. And they have great programs in communications to Sam. So 
not too far away either. So keep that in mind. You may want to go somewhere else, that's great. But right here close to home in journalism and communications, you have some of the best programs in the country. You guys got any questions? I know you're supposed to. Yes. When I, one of the greatest players in National Hockey League history was named Gordy Howe. He's still alive. And he had retired from the Detroit Red Wings. His nickname was Mr. Hockey. That's how good he was. He came out of retirement to leave the National Hockey League and come to the Houston Arrows to play with his two sons, Mark and Marty. Never been done. That was such a huge story. Transcendent hockey, transcendent sports. Mr. Hockey at 44 is going to play with his so when I got out of Baylor, I wanted to come work the Chronicle of the Old Houston Post, which we put out of business in 95. And they asked me if I knew anything about hockey, and I laughed like crazy. And I'll never forget the managing editor said, well, where'd you learn about hockey? Because remember, there's no internet. It was not on TV. And I can't remember what I told him. Maybe somebody in my family used to play hockey, but he hired me. And I had no clue, but it was fun. Covering hockey, and I'm still a hockey fan today and wish we had a franchise. Who else? Don't be afraid. Yes. What do you think of the legal substance policies in the NFL? How do you think they NFL these players suspended all the time. If you smoke, if you smoke body and drink booze, you get multiple chances. If you do performance hands and drugs or anything that is could be masked for performance enhancing drugs. You're suspended immediately. And in the NFL, it's happened so much, it's not that big a deal. It's almost like people expect it. It's never quarterback. Where in baseball, when it happens, it's a huge deal. Baseball is so angry because the media makes such a big deal about it in baseball, but they don't in football. And um, it's every Every team has a list a mile long about things that you can't take that could have exit. Before you buy anything over the counter, get a prescription, you got to go to your team and say, okay, this is what I'm taking or this is what I prescribe and get it approved. It's amazing to me. There used to be a lot more suspended than now. I know they always announce their suspensions on, for drugs on Friday which is the worst news night in the country, and they do, usually do it after everybody's gone home about eight o'clock, where it can only make the nightly news on a Friday when everybody's out. But um, this policy is much tougher in baseball than it is football. Yes, ma'am. My most memorable experience as a sports writer. Um, I've been blessed to cover a lot of big games, a lot of games with names on them, like the drive, the catch, the fumble. If you're young, you don't know what those are, look them up, because they all have names. I've been, like I said, 38 Super Bowls. A lot of them boring, a lot of them spectacular. I've been to multiple countries. I remember we were in Tokyo for the Oilers and Cowboys and the fans could care less about a long run or a long touchdown pass, but when there was a punt, they were like, oh! And it could be just love seeing punts and couldn't believe somebody could actually catch a punt. Um, it's not so much experience, it's, it's the people that I've met. Um, I, I, it's the people, some, most of them I like, most of them I respect, the few I don't like, didn't like, and still don't, but they didn't like me either. But I don't really have, I'll tell you, I'll take that back. In 2006, the Pro Football Hall of Fame honored me with the award that is the ultimate of my profession. It's called the Dick McCann Memorial Award given to one writer a year for distinguished service covering the NFL. And I was put, I've got a plaque in the Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. I rode the parade with all the inductees that year, plus all the guys that come back on the back of a, on the back of a Corvette with my wife next to me and my presenter in front of me. 
and the fans there, 250,000 treated me like I was one of them. And I go back, I've been on the Pro Football Hall of Fame selection committee 22 years. And I go back to Kenton, Ohio every year for the induction of the newest class of Pro Football Hall of Fame. And being there around the heroes of my youth, I used to play like I was those guys in the backyard and then be able to go behind the scenes with them and mingle with them is incredible. Saturday night, I was at a dinner at uh, Fleming's from Gridiron Legends, and two of the greatest players in history, me and Joe Green and Pittsburgh Steelers, the best player on the steel curve, won four Super Bowls in six years in the 70s. He was there, the uh, greatest defensive tackle in history. Kenny Houston played for the Oilers and Washington Redskins, the greatest strong safety. He was there, and we were, it was the Belgian event for kids, and we were, and we were signing autographs, and I was sitting there between them. And you talk about feeling not worthy. And when they would pass me something to sign, here's Joe Green, here's Ken Houston. I wrote way at the bottom, real small, John McLean, because I didn't want to screw it up. But that part, being around those guys, I still get goosebumps when I when I see them and think about all the pleasure, the joy that brought me throughout my life. The sports fan. Yes. That one, the Dick McCann Memorial Award is number one, being on the Hall of Fame selection committee. That's an incredible honor. There's 48 of us. And we, we, my wife gets sick when I say this, but the fact is, we hold open or closed the gateway in football immortality. And I never say that publicly, but that's a fact. Us as a committee, all these guys that make it, some of them could be real jerks when they play and coach. But when they find out they got a chance to go to the Hall of Fame, they turn to mush. And every year we, we put in those Hall of Famers. And being there and watching them be elected, what it means to them and their family, how much they cry, that blows me away every year. There's a seniors committee. I'm on the seniors committee. I'm also on Texas Sports Hall of Fame selection committee. And being in a position to help athletes who deserve it get what they deserve is an incredible honor. One I would never take lightly, one I would never give up. I told them as long as I'm breathing, I'll be on those committees. Who had something back here? Yes, you too. How do you think the uh, Raiders actually gained the They, uh, the largest crowd ever watching an NFL game was the Oilers and Cowboys. 1993 preseason, 112,000 fans. And the stadium was that the stadium had barbed wire around it, had a moat around it, it had a trap door where, if in soccer, they attacked the rail for the visitors to open it, they all go down and lock the door. And when we were in practice, we did that. It's like a medieval dungeon. And they tell me now the stadium has been reduced to 96,000. Sold out instantaneously. I do not think that Mexico City is going to get an NFL franchise. I think London will get two before Mexico City. Mexico right now is still too dangerous. When we were there before, there were machine gun guards everywhere. I'm sure this time there are going to be machine gun guards everywhere. Incredible poverty. Right outside the stadium, people living in like uh, uh, refrigerator boxes, families living in those boxes. And and that's something I just think that it, they'll play a game there every year because they can sell 96,000 seats. And the reason they do it is they want to spread the brand. They're going to play in China soon. They want to see Chinese wearing, wearing the NFL stuff. I went to China. I thought I was going to see a lot of stuff in Yao Ming because this is when Yao was at the epitome of his career with Rockets. And I got off the plane. First thing I see is two cowboy jerseys with T.O. Terrell Owens. And everywhere I went in, in Beijing, Hong Kong, everybody they had a lot of American sports stuff, but it was rip off, like a Raiders cap that was green, not black or silver. Cowboy stuff, it was not the cowboy colors. Well, the NFL wants to get over there and sell their brand, marketed by their people, so the owners can make more money. 
So they're they're gonna they're gonna go global at some point. I just don't think it'll be Mexico. I didn't think they'll play Gabriel every year because the Mexico loves the NFL. Yes. It's changed significantly through the decades. Now because of the internet, uh, you have to get things instantly. The other day, I'm at a lunch with a former Texas player who wants me to help him with a charity. I get a text. And I knew there was a second round pick my sign because I heard his agent come to town. So I wrote a story and I sent it to myself and all I needed to do was fill in the contract numbers. So I get a text while we're at lunch, and I said, excuse me, Chris, so I wanted to get it first. So all I tweeted was, text and sign, C for center, Nick Martin, book of center. So I got it for anybody else. And then I tweeted two or three other things about it. And then I didn't have the numbers at that time, so I called up and I made sure I had the story the way I wanted, and I sent it in to block. There are online people posted. About five minutes later, I got the contract, tweeted that out, then updated the blog, make sure they had the contract in there. So you have to do it instantly. And the thing that bothers me, there are a lot of national media, ESPN, Yahoo, Fox, NFL Network, NFL.com, and they have people trying to get stories on our feet. And a lot of times, they'll get it after us. They don't give us credit. We're supposed to give them credit. A lot of stuff gets stolen, but that's the thing. There's there's no accountability for bad information. So many people put out bad information, and there's no accountability. And I wish there were. Uh, there's this one guy from CBSSports.com, Jason Lock, Lock and Ford. We call him the Lock and Firm. And he, like two years ago, before Baltimore came in December here. He has his big scoop on TV on Sunday morning. Texas GM is about to be removed and moved to another side of the organization. Well, I know it's not true. So I call the owner, he shoots it down, I tweet, it's not true. And I write some more stuff. Well, that general manager's still got a job. And someday, he'll be out, maybe another five years, and he can say, well, see, I had it first. But that drives me crazy when there's so much bad information about my team and there's no accountability for it. And fortunately the boss is not as strict as they used to be. They understand that. Yes. Roger, I know Roger since nineteen eighty two when he was a PR guy. And uh Paul Tagler who was commissioner, he was a lawyer. He wouldn't suspend anybody for anything until it played out in court. Well a lot of guilty players buy people off and never goes to court or they get great attorneys and they charges get dropped and so the guy's guilty but he would never be suspended well Cadell came in he said those days are over if the league thinks you're guilty they're going to suspend you and he's done that the players have gone crazy and and everybody hates him except the owners and the reason is they're making unprecedented amounts of money I see all these media people saying, Cadell's going to be gone. No, he's not going to be gone. Owners love him. People like, they came down too hard on the Patriots. They came down the Patriots because they told them last time they got caught cheating it was fighting. If you get caught again, we're going to come down twice as hard. And every owner, except the Patriots owners, tell him to get Throw the book at him. So he did. Yes. I'm sorry? When the internet came out, we didn't know what it was. And when I was told it was going to be something important to the Chronicle, I listened to a lot of my friends who had been working at the Chronicle and other newspapers say, I'm not going to do anything for that. You know, they can't make me do that. And I thought, I don't want to be an old dog who can't teach new tricks. So the smartest thing I did at the Chronicle was embrace the internet. We started doing videos in 2006, way before anybody was doing videos, went up at 946,000 hits on YouTube. And um, we, were on, we were on the front page of USA Today for what we were doing. 
And uh, then everybody else started doing it. And then I quit doing videos. The prodigal said, why? Are you, is it because of all the insults you get? I said, no, I don't read those insults, but I was getting so fat, I don't want to see myself on video, so I'm not doing them anymore. And I don't. I got a body for radio, not TV. And uh, so I've been fortunate they haven't made me do that anymore. But so many of those people that said, I'm not doing it, they're out of work. They were laid off. They let them, uh, their jobs run out. You have to embrace the internet. I, uh, I didn't have to do Facebook for the longest time because I thought I reached more people doing on the weekly radio shows than I could ever reach on Facebook. And I have 116,000 Twitter followers, number two at the Chronicle, as 50. And so they leave me alone. And only recently they told me that I had, I had to get up the Facebook page to do chats with fans. And uh, so I, did, I do have a Facebook Facebook page, but I don't put anything in there. But I, I, I don't want to be left behind. You get know, all these things about digital, how important it is. But sports, we're usually at the forefront because we have things people want to see, teams you cover. Uh, I don't know why some of the things that we do, you got to get stuff up quick. You know, there's constant. If JJ Watt sneezes, we're going to put a headline. Because JJ gets hits. Johnny Manziel, for the longest time, Johnny Football, you put his name up there, he gets hits. Before he was drafted, I went and spent three days with him in San Diego, and wrote a 70 inch story, a couple other stories, and then a couple for the internet. And I believe they told me that the first story, within five hours, had 476,000 hits. And I could, it couldn't all be A's. That'd be other people interested in me. So one day on the radio, I was telling this story. I said, I'm going to tweet Manziel's name and see how many times it gets retweeted. And I said it on the air. So I tweeted, Johnny Manziel and Senate. It got all kind of attention because people thought I was trying to hint that the Texans were going to draft him, which was not my intention. So then I said, I'm going to tweet his initials. So I tweeted his initials, and they got all kind of retweets. And now, of course, it's not that big a deal. Although I do think Johnny should have a reality TV show. It'd be the hottest thing on TV. I'd watch it. Yes, ma'am. How do you feel about the Texans? Do you like I believe the Texans had the best offseason they've ever had in free agency in the draft. Knowing what they wanted to do after the season, which was get faster on offense. They were so slow last year, like they're running on the moon. And they started, they, in the last two years, they played nine quarterbacks, started seven. Had five last year, started four. They knew they didn't have their franchise quarterback. In January, the coach told me off the record, this kid from Denver, he is the open market. That's who I want. And I said, we all better forget it. Brock Osweiler was staying in Denver. He said, I know. And everybody thought Brock Osweiler was staying in Denver right up until Denver offered him 16 and a half million a year and 30 million guarantee. And the Texas GM told his agent, We will give you the 18 you want if you don't shop the back. So they did. So they got 18 million a year, 37 guarantee. And Bill O'Brien got the quarterback he wanted. And then in the, in the draft, they wanted to get faster. or something. They're going to be so much more exciting to watch. It's not like watching a Flowers like last year. They got speed kill. I can't wait till their OTA start a week from today, and we'll see Osweiler throwing to his receivers. Of course, they the rules are now there's no shoulder pads in all season. He can't hit anybody. So really, it'll be preseason before we know we have an idea of how good they can be on offense. And they were third on defense last year. And so they didn't do much with their defense. I think it's going to be a really fun season. Yes? I wanted to teach you, and this past Saturday, I was given the bucket list of a lifetime, and I spent the day with Ken, and I got to go to the professional football hall. Did you really? It was phenomenal. Wasn't it fun? Thank you so much. I tell, I tell everybody, people ask me about the NFL, and I say there's two things you should try to do if you're a pro football fan. Go to Canton, Ohio. 
and the Brothel Ball of Fame when he prepared to spend several hours. And while you're there, did you go to Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland? When working, I had to stay at NFL. Okay, well, good for you. I'm impressed. And the other one is going to see the Packers at Lambeau Field. Lambeau Field is the cathedral. There's nothing like it. And the fans there are so incredible. If you go to a game there, most fans will treat you like a dog. But in Green Bay, the farther you come, the more respect they have for you, the more they like you, the more they welcome you. They, they love putting on a positive show for their fans. It comes from other teams. So if you ever get a chance to go to Lambo, it'll be tremendous too. And uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, I've been probably 25 times and I still never get tired. One of the things I do during the inductions, and during the induction ceremony, the hall is closed down. So I get them to let me go in by myself and I go into the theater where you can push a button and see any player throughout history. And I'll push Earl Campbell's button so many times because I want to see Earl run over Isaiah Robertson and Jack Tatum. And then I'll go watch other great players throughout history. It's just me and them because otherwise you're in there with fans. And everybody wants to see a lot of the same things. And one time they let me go through it. I told the Hall of Fame, I wanted to go through it at like 3 in the morning when nobody was there, just me. So they let me do it because nobody ever asked. And I walked through it and the security was on and most of the some of the lights. And I wrote, you know, I'm in there standing in the middle of all those bus, like it's almost like they're going to come alive and talk. And the fact they let me do that, what a privilege that was. So I never get tired. I'm so glad you went. I always, when people tell me they've gone, people are always so excited about it because it's history. The NFL was invented right there in 19. 21 but a great gen four. Yes. Do you have any critiques on the college football playoff system? The what about the college system? Do you have any critiques on the college football playoff system? Um eventually they say they're gonna to go to eight and have power of five and three and others. They'll go when they make more money. Everything's about money. National football they may go to Las Vegas. Five years ago, oh my god, they gamble in Vegas. NFL models are so popular because people gamble billions, billions of dollars. So they're going to go to Vegas because it'll make them more money than it would if they stayed in Oakland. And when the networks tell them, okay, we're on eight teams, we'll give you this. I like it so much better than the old way because um, I've always, it's like you want to have a champion. You don't want people to determine it for wire services. You want it to be played out on the field. And it finally is. And there's always going to be some kind of controversy about who gets left out. But it is going to go back. What do you think? Do you like it? Uh, I think it should be at least 16. I think it should be at least 16 for it to be a three playoff. I think it should be at least 16. I'm not including enough teams to have a chance to join. The problem with 16, you know, the colleges, they used to say, you can't play more than 10 games, kids can't study. Well, now they're up to 13 games before that, so I don't think that matters anymore. But if eventually they go to eight, somebody tells them 16, who would have thought when the college basketball went to 64, people are like, oh my God, why would you do that? You can have so many bad teams now. That's the most exciting event in sports today, the top the NCAA tournament. Yes. And came and went like a bad cold. That movie, it should have come out five years ago. When it came out, I told everybody this ahead of time. I'm reading all these things. The NFL is going to hurt the NFL as we know it. The fact is, the NFL had recognized the concussions, made steps to change it. And too bad it didn't come out five years ago. Then it would have been much more profound. I kind of thought Will Smith might get nominated because he's so such a popular actor, but he did the movie lost money. I'll be glad, I didn't see it. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Ted Johnson is on the radio with me on 16 in the afternoon. Ted went four Super Bowls with the Patriots, won three rings, played inside linebackers. Inside linebacker, he had so many cousins in his career, playing for two of the toughest coaches, Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick, 
And I know Ted's dad, and his dad is really worried about him having these head problems. His brain's going to Massachusetts General Hospital to be studied. He got addicted to drugs after his career because of headaches. And if he's next to me and he says he can't remember something, I'm thinking, well, is this the start of it? Well, he was going to take his dad to see concussion. I said, don't do that. Your dad will see that and think that's you. You shouldn't even go see concussion. He said, well, people ask about him on the radio. I said, tell them the truth. You don't want to see it because you, that might be you, and there's nothing that you can do about it. So he didn't, and I'm glad he did. Yes? Yes. I mean, the big the college that's getting the most attention now is Baylor, where I went. When uh, Baylor had players drafted two weeks ago, friends of mine would text me or call me and say, this guy rape anybody? And two guys who committed rape are in prison. The Baylor did not handle it right. They didn't move quick enough. They didn't have the right things in place, the right people. Now that they do, they're getting all this attention about things they screwed up, and they should. I hope he's going to get all kinds of money from Baylor because the way they got treated was terrible. And the fact is, athletes, I'll give you an example. There's a kid that beat the heck out of his girlfriend who was pregnant out on the state, right back. Can't see teach to sign it. And they're like, what? A hunt family, how could you do this? And the kid, Hill, he told me, yeah, I did it, I screwed up, I'll never do it again. And I was stunned that they did. It was bad enough that he, that he bopped her, but she was pregnant. But the fact of the matter is, as the Cowboys proved last year by signing that scumbag drag artist, there are owners out there that sell their souls to the devil if they think it's going to help them win. Now Hardy can't, Hardy can't get a job. And it's not because he beat, beat up a woman. It's because he didn't play on if he'd have played better, if he could have got 10 sacks, he'd have a job. And he may still get one. He'll find God at some point. He's got everything else. some point, he'll find God and do a bunch of stories in the media. And that'll justify an owner saying, well, he deserves, you know, a 15th chance. And unfortunately, the athletes, the athletes are, there's always going to be a job if they can play. And I think that's very, very sad. There's a book that came out about 15 years ago called Pros and Cons. It was written by two investigative reporters by Sports Illustrated. They found out so many things about NFL players at the time, things they'd been charged with in college, but, but the charges were dropped or the women didn't press. And a lot of them were upstanding citizens in the NFL. And when the book came out, I'm thinking, this is when the waters are still there. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I hope none of my guys that I cover are in that book and turn out to be really bad scumbags when they were in college. It wasn't, but it opened a lot of eyes. I read that book, some of the stories that players in college did to women. You can't do it as much, you can't do it now like you did then. Lawrence Phillips, Nebraska, drove a woman up and down the stairs and hit her head on the mailbox so far, cut her head open, first round pick. Everybody knew that. They just got killed and killed themselves in jail, but prison. But it's it's a terrible thing, but um, there's a lot of things. You smoke dope, you beat up guys, but to not beat up women. Yes, we got one back. Yes. That was my last one. Yeah, y'all are too young to see spring breakers, right? <laughs> And that's the problem with that. She's seeking spring breakers. Uh, I did a nine movie, Spring Breakers, last when I was a judge. I was in a scene with uh, Selena Gomez, Ashley Benson, Vanessa Hutchins, and the director's daughter, Valerie Green, in which I threw him back in jail. James Franco, who was, I thought, great with spring breakers, he's sitting there. I sent them back, he bails them out. And that was my scene, the judge in Spring Breakers. <coughs> Excuse me, it was a lot of fun. I'm a big James Franco fan. Sweet Gomez was really nice. She's from Texas. I told her, her dog is named Baylor. 
She had a sister or brother who went to Baylor, and she ever went to college. She was going to go to Baylor. So I introduced, we talked about Baylor and Texas and being Texans and all that. But it was a great experience that we did in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. It's on the table now late at night all the time. I'm sure Mike Demonte's watched it several times. <laughs> My wife, we went to the premier. I guess I can tell high school kids this. It's not like I get fired. <laughs> so we went to the premier. After it's over, my wife said, So what do you think? She said, So well, I changed my color. That movie had way too many breasts. <laughs> I said, Honey, no movie has too many breasts. <laughs> Sorry about you, Lisa. I know that. All right, thanks, you John. <laughs> What else? Yes. To do what? It started with Rookie in 2001 with Dennis Quay. It comes on like every other hour on cable. And uh, the director, John Lee Hancock, went to Baylor in Eastern Texas City. And he'd been a screenwriter in Hollywood for a while. But that was his first directing job. And some Baylor guys asked me, I didn't know him, but I wanted to go where they were shooting. It was in May in Thorndale, Florida, Austin. So they did all the movies. I said, sure, and I went. Went on the set two or three times. Dennis Quaid from Houston was a star. And, uh, and then when they moved to the Rangers ballpark in Arlington, they needed some extras. And I said, why don't you let me, don't get extras off the street. I need to be in people. They'll be both size of the movie. So they did. And, and I was going to get out of the picture of press box and let my friends be there, but he called me up. And, Put me first on the road. Nobody recognized me anymore. I was about 100 pounds less, and I had hair. That was the first one. Uh, the Longest Yard remake, uh, Game Plan with the Rock, uh, Friday Night Bites with uh, Bob Thornton, um, Secretariat with, with uh, Diane Lane and John Malkovich. And then I, one I had the biggest in part was called. Cook County with Anson Mount from O-U-N-T. He has a show called Hell on Wheels on ANC, in which he, it was all about crystal meth addiction in the Piney Woods, but I was one of the few not addicted to crystal meth. So it's been it's been fun. I got a screen actor's bill card. People always say they don't believe me, so I pop that baby out and show it to them. That's been a lot of fun. You get a, you get a lot of money doing that. They think it's not even much money, but for me it is. What else? You got some more? Yes. I would have taken shorthand when I was young. Now we record, I have a tape recorder on my iPhone, so I tape everything. But um, for the longest time, you took notes. Now my handwriting is so bad I can't read it. I wish I had taken shorthand uh, way back. I was at Baylor because that would help me the longest time. And another thing, probably anything else I regret. No, I don't. I can't. I've been blessed. I mean, 38 years of covering the NFL, get the right and talk about the National Football League, and go to the Super Bowl, and the Pro Bowl, and playoff games, and, and there's some. When I told you guys earlier, you could look up the drive, the catch, and the fumble. Three of the most greatest, most memorable plays in NFL history. Games. I mean, not only like the catch, which was Joe Montana, the 49ers, throwing a 49er, so the pass to his receiver, Dwight Clark, beat the Cowboys in 1981 NFC Championship game, in which San Francisco replaced the Cowboys as a dynasty. And I'm standing right there in the back of the end zone. He went right in front of me and caught that pass. And, and that's why, not just to cover him, be so close that you're almost like you're right there. And another really cool thing I did that my friends don't think you guys do to know young people like soccer. At the stadium, Energy, they've had some humongous soccer matches there, including one once that had Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi and some of the greatest players in history. And you know, on soccer, they put an inner fence that's at. So I got passes from the Texans to go stand at that fence. So I'm standing right here. And Ronaldo's may be here, and I could have reached out and popped him up side of the head. Messi was just a little short 18-year-old when this happened. 
and he's over there doing a corner kick, and I could have slapped the ball out of his hands. Now, I've never been that close to any sport ever as I was for soccer. And you know, there's 70,000 fans. They never sit. One of the Texans told me, I told one of the owners, wouldn't you like to have your Texans fans like this? He said, no, they buy beer and go to, they buy food. These fans just stand and cheer. They never go buy anything. And it's because they're so loyal. I love to go watch when the Mexicans team is here from Mexico and watch them play because the fans are like nobody else. So I get a really a kick out of it. I wouldn't, that was as far as interesting experience as being right there, knowing all these other people. I'm like, God, you're so close to this at the moment. And I'm like, yeah, so. And that's another really cool thing about my job. Yes. Advice I would give for people wanting to be a sports writer. First of all, newspapers are declining. Our the Chronicle is shrinking. Now, we don't have a lot of ads, but the Chronicle.com and Houston Chronicle.com are made up. We used to have 550,000 subscriptions a day. Now we have about 250, but we're still top 10 in the country. People ask me, if you had a choice of the paper or the website, what would you write for? I said, the website. Because you can tell exactly how many people are reading your story where you cannot tell how many people are reading your story in the newspaper. Because there are so many websites and anybody can blog, I tell people this, find somebody that you like the way they do their job. Then don't find a guy who's a great writer writing for, for Sports Illustrated or ESPN. You can't beat them right now. Find somebody else that covers a team or or just covers a week and read them and try to see why they did what they did, how they used their quotes. They can watch TV or the internet and see how people get interviewed, see how people on ESPN use their hands when they talk. They coach them to use their hands because if they wanted to make a point, they wanted to do like this. I want your hands up here, look like you're doing the right thing. You want to put that into something that some of them do a lot better than others. I, I'll do it when I have to, but watch people you think are good and see how they do their job. And remember, you can, you can, if you had some ideas being your life, you can, you can email them. You know, they might get back to you and they might not, but if you're persistent and you put the subject line in advice instead of you're a bomb, I hate you, die, uh, put something in there. High school student needs advice. I guarantee you most of them will get back to you. You got a question, Mike? You oh, just... no. <laughs> yes. I think the NFL is not nearly as good with Tom Brady not in it. I think that the fact that the Texans are going to Fox for the third game and playing the Patriots without Tom Brady gives them a chance. Where they would have no prayer, Brady were playing. But the reason they did what they did, they got in trouble spiking. And they told them, if you get caught again, we're going to be twice as tough. Every owner thinks the Patriots is cheap all the time in so many different ways. Some have uh, people come in and sweep the visiting dressing room to see if they have buds. Others will go in the showers if they have talked about strategy. They do not trust the Patriots, and they can't prove it on the communicative device between the play caller and quarterback. It just happens to go out sometimes in a crucial moment, just briefly. That way you can't, there's no pattern, so you can't prove it. So that's why when they got them on the play gig, I mean, that's a pimple on an elephant's butt. And, but the owners want to make, like it's a tumor because they want to get the Patriots. They're jealous of their success. You know, they're jealous of Tom Brady. In fact, he's great. I think he's the greatest quarterback ever. Of course, he's got a wife that makes any big in the air, and he's a really good looking guy. He's popular. So, a lot of it's about jealousy. The Patriots were the, the Browns, somebody like that, Bills. They wouldn't have gotten that kind of trouble. All right, time for one more question. One more question. I'm talking, somebody asked me who's the best actor I've worked with. I'm glad you asked. Adam Sandler. 
Adam Sandler is a great athlete, great basketball player, a really nice guy. He hadn't made a good movie in so long. I, when I met him on the set of The Longest Yard, and went to dinner with him and went to a steakhouse with he and his director, all we played for three hours talked about football. He's a Jets fan. And when I've gone to LA, if they're filming a movie, I go on the set, talk, it just couldn't be nicer. And I've seen all of his movies. I feel like I should out of loyalty, but it's been hard. <laughs> oh my God, it's been hard. But he is a, a lot of them are really nice. Wayne Johnson, but um, I was so impressed with Santa and the fact that he's a good basketball player, a big sports fan, and very generous to the people in his office. Before I go, I'll tell you about his office. It's called Happy Mass. You're at Sony Studios, and you're walking up and down all the streets. Every Everything is pristine, the flowers, the grass, the offices, and then in the distance, you'll see one of the cars parked on the grass, balls, basketball, volleyball, all the softballs laying in the street, bats, dogs running around. That's Happy Mass. That's Adam's. That's Adam's office because it's exactly what you'd expect Adam Sandler's office to be, and it is. Uh, in the in the start of the movie Longest Yard, I went to the premiere. I'm in his producer's office at Happy Madison two hours before the premiere. He says, "Tell me what you think about these two songs." So he plays them. I said, "I like that one." Why? He said, well, "That's what I'm thinking about having in the to start the movie." I said, "What do you mean? We're gonna be here in two hours." I said, you can do that now? He said, yeah, because of computers, and you can do anything you want. So we get to you know, Hollywood Boulevard, Thomas Chinese Theater, movie starts, and there's that song. Somebody put it in there like that, I still can't figure it out. Thank you guys very much for having me. I'll walk around out here if you got any other questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much. And uh, Don, as a, as a thank you, uh, we want to to give you this uh, High School Journalism Network coffee mug. So you can Thank get you. that at the desk. All right, guys. So uh, as we dismiss, and like John said, if, if y'all want to come up, we'll get a big group photo. But, but as we dismiss, I just want to thank everyone once again. Thank you to the students for participating. Thank you to all the advisors for encouraging your students to attend these, as I think they're very beneficial for them. Uh, Stacy Thomas is here. She advises all the advisors. Uh, from the district level, so thank you, Stacy, for your support. And uh, you know, last but not least, I want to thank all my communication staff. Nicole Ray, our assistant superintendent, is here. Uh, Stephanie Meagle, our director, in the back, uh, been very supportive. Uh, Dave DeJohn, representing our uh, TV uh, CFIC Cinema, is here. Uh, Vanessa, coach, also thank you, and thank you for getting John to come here and all the hookups that, that you've had. And uh, Gary Harper, thank you so much. <laughs> All the photos you've taken throughout the year. It's been an awesome year. Look forward to next year, guys. Have a great one. We'll see you later. Something I'd love to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there a how much is that on? Yeah. No, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs>
I gave Billy his, I just forgot. Yeah. I was like, ah. 